Hey everyone, my name is Austin, and I'm so glad that you decided to watch our River Valley Rogue River sermon. We are a church located in the beautiful city of Rogue River, and we would love to connect with any and all of you. One of the best ways you can do that is by joining our Facebook page. You can type in River Valley Rogue River, and you can join our page. Another way to do that is by sending direct emails. If you want to be in contact, if you need any prayer, make sure to reach out. We would love to get in contact with you. We hope that this sermon blesses you. Have a great rest of your day. Well, good morning, guys, and happy Father's Day. I appreciate all of you fathers and everything that you guys do and the spiritual fathers out there. Uh, dads truly are, um, play such a huge role in our society and all of our lives, and so uh, glad to celebrate you today. Uh, today, we're studying in the book of Philippians, so if you have your Bible, which I hope you do, go ahead and pull it out and turn to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to be starting in verse 3. Uh, today, we're going to be studying through 11 verses. Well, ideally, um, that's the goal. Now, while that does not seem like a ton of verses, the truth is, is that there is a lot of stuff to study in these few verses. In fact, as I was studying this week, I kind of felt like the man who tried to describe a redwood tree to a blind man. Have you guys heard that story? It's kind of an interesting story. The story goes that there's a blind man and a man standing in the redwoods. And he says, describe a redwood tree to me. And so the guy says, okay, well, there's bark that wraps around the tree. The tree's larger than my wingspan. It goes up high. He said, there's moss that kind of dangles off that kind of looks like a man's goatee, just sort of dangling off uh, the, the branches. And then he said, oh, speaking of the branches, the higher you look, the, there are branches that are as large as trees itself. It's incredible. And the guy says, I need more. I need more. What else? What else? And the guy says, dude, I'm dumbfounded. They're just really big. They're massive. They're large trees. And that's kind of how I felt as I was studying this passage this week. I just felt like there's a bigness in this passage of scripture. And I have a sneaking suspicion that this bigness and this massiveness and the density of this book will be something that we consistently see through this summer as we're studying through the book of Philippians. Like Tim said last week, Philippians was a letter that was written to the believers gathered in the city of Philippi. Philippi was an important city in ancient history. And the reason it was so important is because Philippi served as a link between Asia and Europe. It was a place where people from Asia and Europe would meet up and they would trade. They would exchange silks from the east and grain from the west, and they would send it back to their homelands. It was sort of like a port city, and it was an important place in ancient history. And it's to this city that Paul is writing a very small, punchy, and powerful letter to the church gathered in Philippi. If you notice on your notes today, there are no notes. Um, that's a sort of intentional because, like I said, there's a lot we're going to be talking through. And so I figured, you know what? You're all artists. That's your blank slate. Go wild. Write whatever you want, okay? Have a good time. And so uh, hopefully we're going to have a really great study. Like I said, there's a lot to cover. I'm thinking maybe an hour, maybe, I think. Um, and you're going to love it. All right, let's go. Philippians 1, verse 3. Here we go. This is Paul writing. He says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. We're going verse by verse, folks. I'm going to read a little bit and talk a little bit. One more time. Verse 3. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. This verse is awesome. This verse is incredible. Now, from just reading it right here, you may not see the awesomeness and the nuance and the beauty of what Paul is saying, but the reality is, is that Paul being thankful for his memories with the people in Philippi is a miracle. And the way we know this is by accurately understanding the context about the book of Philippians. And so if you're in your Bibles at the book of Philippians, what I want you to do is I want you to start turning left, and I want you to go to the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 16, verse Six. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, the book of Acts is an incredible resource. And the reason it's an incredible resource is because the book of Acts sort of is a 
overview or a behind the scenes of all of the books in the New Testament. One of my favorite things to do, Maddie knows this, she's not here right now, she's in in Virginia, but one of my favorite things to do, I've told you guys this a hundred times, is watching movies at night with my wife. I just love that. I love watching movies at night with my wife with some boom chicka pop popcorn. Costco's on sale right now, buy one, get one free, snag those up, they're incredible, and just watching a good movie. And one movie that we watched so many times a few summers ago was the movie The Greatest Showman. Do you guys, have you guys seen that movie? Raise your hand if you've seen that movie. How awesome is Hugh Jackman, right? Like, uh, that guy's incredible. I love it. That was way too much of an amen, Shauna. That was, that was way too much. All right, all right. Whoa, all right. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But we love that movie. We love the cinematography. We love just the artistic stuff in it. We loved the music, the songs, the, everything that just went into that movie. We just appreciated so much. But as much as we love the movie, what Maddie and I actually enjoyed more was the hours and hours and hours of all the behind the scenes. Have you guys ever seen that? It's it's crazy. It's showing the director talking to the cast of how to frame a certain scene or listening to them rehearse the music as a cast and listening to them add certain things into the movie and uh, watching Zendaya learn how to fly up in the sky with that, that, that cloth. It was just so cool and fun to watch. We love the behind the scenes. Well, the book of Acts is the behind the scenes to the New Testament. It adds context. It adds a background to what is being said specifically in Paul's epistles. And so in Acts chapter 16, we see a behind the scenes of the formation in the church at Philippi. And so here's what it says. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to my Asia, they tried to go into Bithynia. But the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by my Asia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him. Cross over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So as you can see, Paul did not want to go to Philippi. He didn't want to go to Macedonia. Where did he want to go? He wanted to go east. He wanted to go into Asia. But the text says that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus kept him from doing so. Now, stay with me here, folks. I think Paul was pretty frustrated when he got turned down from going into Asia, right? I mean, you guys know how that is. When you have an expectation and you want to do something, when you want to go on vacation, but your plans get canceled, when you want to do something, but then for whatever reason, circumstances out of your control restrict you from doing that said thing. Unmet expectations can take a great day and make it a good day, and a good day, a bad day. And I imagine that for a moment, Paul was sort of feeling this way. Now, when it comes to unmet expectations, the truth is, is that you and I can respond to those unmet expectations one of two ways. I think the first and most common way that we respond to unmet expectations is by number one, pouting and doubting. You and I know what this looks like. It sounds something like, God, I have been so incredibly obedient to you. I have lived my life trying to serve you. And so why didn't I get that promotion at work? God, I have worked so hard for my vacation. My plans have been canceled time and time again. The world is opening back up, but of course, I have that selfish family member that monopolizes everything about them, and now my plans are canceled. Or, I've read all the books about parenting. I've spent so much time praying and thinking and nurturing my children, yet for whatever reason, as they grew up, they're crap. (laughs) They're just not great. (laughs) Happy Father's Day. No. (laughs) Right? When our expectations aren't met, we can either pout and doubt, or number two, we can press on and we can trust in God's plans. Here's what that looks like. That looks like something like this. God, I don't know what you're doing right now. I have no idea. But what I do know is that I trust you. God, the last three months have been a living hell, but what I do know is that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God, I don't know why I didn't get the job or the promotion, but I trust that you are my provider and my protector and my sustainer. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I know that. I know that you remain. 
Friends, listen to me. There are always going to be unexplained no's in your life. But listen to me, this is the important part. That's okay. It's okay. Because every no from God may be leading you to a greater yes from God. And this was the case for Paul. Do you remember what happened to Paul when he rolled up to Philippi? Remember, he jumped off the boat and he met someone. He met a woman by the name of Lydia. And she was selling some fine linen. Remember what happened? Lydia believed in Jesus. She trusted in Jesus as her savior. And Lydia became a cornerstone of the early church that was gathering in Philippi. Now let's fast forward 10 years from Acts 16 to the writing of Philippians and Paul is in prison in Rome. And who visits him? A guy by the name of Epaphroditus who is bringing gifts from the church in Philippi. The church that started with an unmet expectation, was now bringing Paul great joy as he was shackled in jail in Rome. The point I'm making is that every unopened door in our life, every promotion we miss out on, every long lost relationship that doesn't pan out is an opportunity for God to do something greater in your life. In verse three, Paul was thankful for the closed door to Asia because that closed door to Asia opened up an opportunity in Philippi. And when he was in jail, guess who it was that was ministering to him? Philippi. The people in Philippi. Friends, the point is this. Don't be discouraged when God says no. Because sometimes God's no is leading you to a greater yes. Is leading you to a greater yes. That was the case for Paul, and that can be the case for us. Let's continue, verse three. I told you we're gonna be here a while, okay? Cancel your lunch plans. We're gonna keep going. Verse three, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now again, I wanna continue to form the picture in your mind of what's taking place. Paul was writing this from a Roman prison. He was writing this from a Roman prison and he was penning it to the church at Philippi. Now, Roman prisons back then are not like prisons today. They didn't have yard time. They didn't have basketball hoops and intramural games. They didn't have ESPN plus to watch the NBA playoffs. Rehabilitation was not really a thing that the Roman authorities gave their inmates. They were pretty desolate places, especially for a guy like Paul, who's, who's being accused of crimes that were rebellion against the government of Rome. Really, the great freedom that Paul had as a prisoner there would have been the reality that he could write letters And occasionally he could have visitors, which is what Epaphroditus is doing. In fact, to kind of help paint the picture more clearly of what is going on in Paul's current situation, I want to show you an ancient prison that is standing still today in Rome. It's called the Mamertine Prison, and there's a picture of it. It's located in the old city of Rome. And in that prison, you can see there's actually a little shrine that is uh, built up there for the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. It's believed that both of these men spent time in this prison at one point or another. Now, what is the Mamertine prison? What does it show us? Well, the Mamertine prison was essentially a small room with a hole in the floor that actually tapped into parts of the sewer system in Rome. Now, you might be thinking, why in the world would they build a prison with access to a sewer system? Well, I found an article that actually did a really good job of describing why they would do that, and they outlined three particular reasons. The first reason they would do that is because, as you can imagine, the smell in this prison would have been gnarly. It would have been brutal. You're underground, you're cold, there's a running stream of human mm, coming through. (laughs) That's not very flattering. So number one, it would have smelled horrible. Number two is because it was a way of quickening the death of the inmates. I'll explain. People that were held in this bottom cell were not given food and they were not given water. And so if the prisoners wanted to eat or drink something, guess where they went? The running water. Yeah, right? Thank you, Susie. (laughs) Nasty. They would go, oh, look, that looks like that could be preserved. And they would partake of whatever rolled through the sewer system. So I'm just going to park the car there and I'm going to let you think about that. Gross. Gross. And the third thing that they would do is when they would execute a prisoner, what they would do is they would go down into the prison cell, they would pull that prisoner out and they would take them out and they would execute them publicly. 
After they would execute them publicly, it's pretty gross and brutal, they would dismember parts of the body and they would take certain parts of the body, throw them in the sewer system in front of all the other inmates to foreshadow their impending doom. He said, oh, you like little Billy? Check it out, here's his finger. Here's his arm. This is gonna be you. And so it was a fear tactic. It was a fear technique. It was a way of scaring these people. And so this is a pretty bleak situation for Paul, which is why verse four and five are so cool. Let's throw up on the screen. Verses four and five, Paul says this. He says, I am always praying with, say it with me, with joy. One more time, with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Do you notice that Paul in this environment still has the capacity for joy? He still has the capacity for joy. What does this teach you and me? Here's what it teaches us. Listen closely. What this shows us is that joy is not just a feeling. Joy is an attitude. Joy is a disposition. I'll I'll explain it this way. Every single one of us in this room has feelings, okay? Even, Even me, all right? I'm a fairly logical, stoic kind of guy. I have maybe two feelings a day, but nonetheless, I still have feelings, okay? Some of you, very stoic, very, whatever it is, every single one of us in this room has feelings. I remember when Maddie and I first got married, we had a lot of feelings for each other. And I'm not saying great feelings, okay? They were really bad feelings. I've told you guys this before, okay? First three months of our marriage summed up in one word, hell. (laughs) Horrible, absolutely horrible. I remember so clearly, I'll I'll never forget this. We were living in our house on C Street and I was laying in bed with my back turned to my wife and I was looking out the sliding window and I was thinking to myself, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this for the next 70 years. There's no way I'm gonna be able to do this. This is horrible. And the worst part is, is that I knew to my backside that there was my sweet wife with her back turned to me thinking the same exact thing. (laughs) That man's a monster. (laughs) He's insane. And I'll tell you, during that first three months, there were a lot of negative feelings that we had for each other. But I'll tell you, the one phrase that we kept coming back to time and time and time and time and time again, all throughout that first three months, we said it religiously, was this. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. Austin, you're an idiot. We're on the same team. (laughs) Austin, you're being stupid. We're on the same team. We're the Abbots. We are together. We are unified. We are joined together. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Sure, I may not like you right now. You may not like me right now. We may not like each other right now. We may not want to be around each other right now, but guess what? We're on the same team. Our feelings constantly fluctuated, but our attitude and commitment that we made to each other in front of God and man, that was unshakable. That was unshakable. Friends, that's kind of what joy is. You see, joy is this unshakable disposition or attitude that isn't based on your circumstances. It's not based on your surroundings. It's not based on political ebbs and flows. It's not based on political ideologies. It's based on something much more deeper, much more richer. Paul had joy when he was in a horrific situation. And later in this letter to the people in Philippi, Paul actually writes something really cool. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Now, I want to acknowledge something, something that um, is really important to talk about and something that I'm not normally accustomed to talking about. And it's this concept that choosing joy is a lot easier said than done. And I want to recognize that. I especially want to recognize that because today in 2021, there appears to be a very real pandemic that is affecting many people, and I'm talking about mental illness. I'm talking about the reality of depression, anxiety, fear, and mental battles taking place. In fact, I was reminded of the pervasiveness of this problem this last Wednesday when we were at CAD. At CAD, every year, we obviously have seniors that are graduating, and we have a thing called Senior Night. And Senior Night is a time where all of the seniors basically sit up on stage, and they tell the rest of the high school what they have learned, what they have gathered from their time being in high school. And I'll tell you, folks, this broke my heart. It broke my heart because there are 30 high schoolers up there, 
And time and time and time and time and time again, these high schoolers were pouring out their hearts and saying, you know, one of the most difficult things for me in high school was just this anxiety. It was just this overwhelming sense of depression. It was this overwhelming sense of fear of the unknown. And for me, full transparency, I've never experienced that. I I don't necessarily know what that's like. And so for a guy like me to stand up here and say, listen, choose joy and move on, which is my natural inclination, make a decision, stick to it, discipline yourself and power through, that doesn't do much. That doesn't hold much water. Now, I'm not naive. I know that if certain high schoolers were feeling that, I definitely know that in a room this size and with our audience online, I know that some of you are in that space as well. And so with that in mind, here's what I wanna do. I wanna spend the next 10 minutes or so giving us three tools that will give us the ability to access the kind of joy that Paul experienced when he was in prison, okay? Three tools, three tools that we can add to our tool belt. Number one, the prerequisite for experiencing the kind of joy Paul had was number one, a persistent prayer life. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. It's a persistent prayer life. I want you to see what Paul says here in verse four. You guys are gonna geek out for this. This is great. Verse four, Paul says, I'm always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Now, I want you to see something. I want you to look at this. Look at this, look at this. Paul says, I am always praying. Pretty cool, right? But what? With, say it with me, with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Do you notice what joy is smack dab in the middle of? It's prayer. Now, I love what Paul's doing here. Check it out. He says, I'm always praying. What does that mean? Always praying denotes a consistent activity. It denotes a lifestyle. You're always breathing. Paul's always praying. It denotes an activity that is taking place in the now. But then Paul follows it up with all of you in my every prayer. Now that's a fascinating phrase. And here's why that's fascinating. Because every prayer denotes a consistency of past prayer. So Paul is saying, not only am I praying for you now, I was praying for you then. And in the middle of both of those prayers is what? Is joy. Is joy. Is unspeakable joy. So number one, you want to access the kind of joy that Paul experienced, you must, number one, have a persistent prayer life. Now, some of you are going, Austin, that's Christianity 101. I already got that in my tool belt, chief. Give me something good. Okay, no need to be so mean, but we'll keep going, all right? Look at verse four and five. Paul says, I'm always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership. I want to pause there. Because of your partnership. That's a cool word. That's a really cool word. And I want to tell you why that's a cool word. Because in the Greek, that word partnership is the word koinonia. You guys know what koinonia means? Partnership. Partnership. Bam. Fellowship. (laughs) You got a big brain. Third row back. It means association. It means a fellowship. It means a community. It means gathering. That's what koinonia means. Now, I want to stop here and I want to talk about this. Every single one of you, whether you like it or not, are involved in some sort of koinonia. You're involved in some side of community, in some sort of fellowship, whether that be a work koinonia, whether that be a family koinonia, whatever it is, the reality is if you're involved in sports, we're all a part of some sort of koinonia. But Paul doesn't just say the anecdote to a joyless life is being in community. He adds an addendum. He says, because of your partnership in the what? In the gospel. In the gospel. In the gospel. And this leads us to our second point. The second tool we need to experience joy is number two, friendships with people who love Jesus. Friendships with people who love Jesus. When you are around other people who have a vivacious love for God, here's the truth, you can't help but feel that same level of joy. Feel that same level of excitement. See, the truth is is that some of us in this room have a very difficult time experiencing and walking in joy because we are surrounding ourselves with people and practices that steal our joy. We're in a koinonia that is not healthy, it's bad. Maybe for some of us, we've got to really reevaluate some of our relationships. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, walk with the wise and become wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Proverbs 12, 26 says, the righteous choose their friends 
carefully. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. It is difficult to choose joy when our friends and our community are constantly stealing joy from us. So be in a koinonia of people who love Jesus and are devoted to the gospel. That is foundational for us as a church. A few weeks ago at Vision Celebration, I shared with you guys that here at our small little church in Rogue River, there's 75% of you involved in life groups. That's insane. That's remarkable. Because here's what I recognize, is that as a church, it's good when we gather, but what's even better is when we're together. When we're in groups, when we're in life groups, when we're doing life together, we're praying for each other. We're with each other. That's the bread and butter. That's the good stuff. I like teaching, don't get me wrong. I think there's, I think there's incredible power in the pulpit. I believe that. But what I believe in even more is the reality that we have to be in koinonia with each other. We have to be in koinonia with each other. And I'll tell you, that blueprint for church ministry, for church growth, for church multiplication has never failed. And that's what we go after here today. It's being in a community, a koinonia of people who love Jesus and love the gospel. The third tool for choosing joy is, I believe, at the foundation of all of this, and this is number three, a focus on the Lord. A focus on the Lord. Joy comes from Jesus. Do you remember what Paul says later in the book of Philippians? He says, rejoice in the, rejoice in the Lord. Notice that he does not say rejoice in yourself. That'll make it happen. Rejoice in yourself. No, no, no. Rejoice in your bank account. I got a lot of zeros in it. And I'm not talking zero, zero. I'm talking like one, zero, 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 zero. I'm talking, I got, I got change, man. He doesn't say rejoice in your children's accomplishments. Look how good my kids are. Look at everything they have accomplished. No, 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 no. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Fix your focus on Jesus. My favorite story in the Bible about the point of focusing on Jesus takes place in Matthew chapter 14. And I can't wait till we get to Matthew. It's gonna be in like 2024 or something like that. But <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. Let me tell you, get ready for it. It's gonna be great. But the story in Matthew 14 is of Peter uh, walking on water, sort of. I wanna read it to you. Here, here, here's what it says. Matthew 14, 25. About three o'clock in the morning. It's midnight, folks. You're sleeping, right? It's, it's dark out. You're at REM sleep. And Jesus came toward them. The disciples were on a boat walking on the water. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Look at verse 30, though. This is the kicker. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Did you notice that Peter began to sink when he started focusing on the storm instead of his savior? When he was standing there going, okay, those are some big white caps. This is getting a little crazy. Then what happened? He started, he started to sink. Focus on the Lord. A little acronym I remember learning when I was at Grace Bible and something that we teach our kids back in children's ministry is what is joy? Well, it's very simple. Joy, Jesus, others, and then yourself. If you want joy, folks, it starts foundationally with your eyes focused on Jesus. It starts with your eyes focused on Jesus. It's not about you. I say that to you every week. It's not about you. Focus on the Lord. So what have we learned about Paul's joy in prison? Well, his joy was not based on his circumstances. Instead, it was empowered by his attitude of prayer, his Jesus-loving friends, and his relentless and unshakable focus on Jesus. Three tools, three tools. Let's get back to the text, verse six. Yeah, we're good on time, we're fine. <laughs> we're not good on time, folks. Verse six, <laughs> I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Very, very famous verse. 
Many of you have memorized this verse. Many of you, when you were young Christians, this was one of the first verses that you memorized. And this is a good one to memorize. What this verse speaks to is the reality that the God of the Bible is incredibly consistent and remarkably reliable. God does not just save you from your sin. He sets you apart for his plan. And you and I both know that we can live this life with expectation and with a joyful disposition. Why? Well, because Jesus is alive. Do you see see what he says there? He says, carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's coming back. And since he's coming back, it means that you and I have something to do. It means that we have a direction to go towards. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is alive. So walk in joy. Verse seven, indeed, it is right for me to think this way. Everybody hold your fingers up. It is right for me to think this way. Think this way about all of you, because I have you in my, get them up, heart, and you are all partners, throw your arm up, we're all friends, partners, <laughs> partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is insanely cool. I wanna close our time today by reminding you of something incredibly simple that will change your life forever, okay? Listen, here it is. Jesus loves you. (laughs) Jesus really loves you. And in this passage, Paul lays out a beautiful picture of what affection and love looks like. Let's look at verse seven. He says, it is right for me to think this way about all of you. Paul, in his head, when he was in jail, was reminiscing. He was thinking about all of the people gathered in Philippi. He remembers the day that he hopped off the boat and he met Lydia, the fine garment seller. He remembers what it was like when she believed in Jesus. He remembers what it was like to be a part of the first meetings when a guy by the name of Epaphroditus walked in and met Jesus and believed in Jesus as a savior. Paul remembered what it was like to have interesting conversations in the back with Yodia and Syntyche about church order. Paul could think of many examples of the church in Philippi. He could think of many ways that he had affection and love for these people. Did you know that Jesus thinks about you? Did you know that? I want to say that again. Did you know that Jesus thinks about you? The God of the universe, the creator of everything, thinks about you. Psalm 139, verse 16 and 18 says, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Look at this, look at this. God, how precious your thoughts are to me how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I'm still with you. Friends, Jesus thinks about you. If you're a Christian in this room, do you remember the time that Jesus saved you? Do you remember what took place that day when you realized that every single one of your past, present, and future sins were put on the cross and person of Jesus for you. Sometimes I think about it. Sometimes I think about it. And I, I just, I remember right where I was. I was sent down, I was sent down uh, to Mexico on spring break. My mom forced me to go. I didn't want to go. I had no desire to go. I had hot plans with my girlfriend, okay? I didn't want to go to Mexico. Mom said, Megan can't go to Mexico if you don't go. I'm like, okay, well, it looks like I gotta get my passport. <laughs> I don't have one. And sure enough, God's like, bam, passport. I'm like, what the, okay, fine. I guess I'm going to Mexico. I went down to Mexico, and I remember right where I was. Music was playing. We were in an amphitheater down in an orphanage. It was an adult orphanage. I didn't know that. I thought it was cute little, like, Mexican kids, and we were going to be playing soccer with them. It was an orphanage with uh, mentally handicapped adults, and I had no idea. Talk about a humbling experience. So I remember right where I was. I was in this amphitheater. Worship leader was singing a song. I don't even remember what song it was, but I remember that at that moment, God hit me like a ton of bricks hit me like a ton of bricks and he convicted me of my sin and he 
literally drove me to my knees in repentance and belief in Jesus as my savior. And I remember it so clearly. I remember right where I was. And I, I, remember, I remember it being so real and saying, God, how could you save me? I'm destined for hell, separated from you, but you and your infinite love, the creator of everything, you are thinking about me and you're meeting me right where I'm at and you're saving me. Why are you doing this? And then I remember saying, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. Whatever you, how could I not? If you've saved me, I will, I will do anything for you because I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your love. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember that joy, and truthfully, there, there, there are times where I'm just like, Lord, take me back to that joy of my salvation. Take me back to that moment. Take me back to that time that I myself remember so clearly. And this week as I was studying, I was reminded that I remember it clearly, but guess what? Jesus remembers it clearly too. He was there with me. He was there with you when he broke your heart. He was there with you when you said, Lord, I got nothing, filthy rags. And he said, I'm gonna give you clean, white as snow, pure perfection of my son, Jesus. He was there and he saved you. He thinks about you, but not only does he think about you, Jesus also has emotional affection for you. Some of you right now are so emotionally distraught, going through something incredibly difficult with your emotions, but look at what Paul says. He says, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. Paul related to the people of Philippi emotionally. Do you guys remember the story about the Philippian jailer? Remember Paul? The brother's in prison nonstop, man. That guy was in prison nonstop. And there was a time he was in prison in Philippi, and the earth shook, and it shook violently, and the chains fell off of his wrist, and he was free. And the jailer who was overseeing everybody in that prison thought, this isn't good. And so he pulled out his sword and he was gonna fall on it and kill himself. He was gonna commit suicide. But right before that happened, Paul said, wait, brother, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I need to tell you about Jesus. And in that story, it goes that the Philippian jailer believed in Jesus and then immediately they packed up, they walked to the Philippian jailer's house and his entire household believed in Jesus. They were all baptized and they were added to the numbers of the church that very day. It's an incredible story. And as I was thinking about that story, something hit me like a ton of bricks, and it was this. That jailer, in the matter of a few moments, went from death to life. And this was not a story that Paul read about. This was a person that he saw. Can you imagine being Paul and looking at this Philippian jailer with the look of, I'm going to kill myself in my eyes? the lowest moment of his life. And then just a few moments later, that guy's on his knees holding his hands up saying, hallelujah, you've saved me. And here's what hit me. What hit me is that there was one constant in that story and that was this. It was that Jesus met that Philippian jailer at his worst moment and he was also with that Philippian jailer at his greatest moment. When he realized that he had been forgiven. What that shows you and me is that Jesus meets you right where you are. It means that in the darkness of your depression, Jesus is there. In the midst of your chronic pain, Jesus is there. In your loneliness, Jesus is there. In all of your needs, Jesus is there. In your emotional pain, Jesus is there. In your joy, Jesus is there. In your triumph, Jesus is there. In your perseverance, Jesus is there. In your breakthrough, Jesus is there. Jesus meets you right where you are at. He's not scared away by your depression, your fear, your doubt, or your frustrations. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Friends, God does not just think about you. He meets you where you are emotionally. Some of us are going, nobody would ever know the depths of the pain that my heart is experiencing. Jesus knows because he's with you because he's there with you right now. Jesus thinks about you, but he's also 
with you emotionally. He feels with you. But again, it doesn't stop there. Paul says, it's right for me to think this way about you because I have you in my heart and you're all partners with me in grace. Paul is saying, we're in this together. He's saying that even though I'm in prison, even though I'm shackled, even though I'm living in hell, I'm with you and you're with me. Friends, did you know that when Jesus saved you from your sin, he didn't just save you, he also set you apart. He also equipped you and sent you to do his good work. He didn't just save you and walk away. He didn't just give you a life jacket. He's like, hey, make do. No. He says, I've saved you. And then he picked you up and he equipped you. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 says, now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever, amen. One big question that many Christians and people, citizens of the US, people of the world are asking themselves today is this question. What is my purpose? What am I here for? What is the role of my life on this big ball of dirt? (laughs) Well, if you're a Christian, the Bible answers that question. And it answers that question incredibly clearly. If you are a Christian, you have been saved by God and you've been set apart for his plan. Or in other words, you say, what's my purpose? Here it is, it's his plan. Well, what's his plan? Here it is, folks, ready? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love thy neighbor as yourself. Or in other words, You have been greatly loved, and so act like it. Act like it. When somebody is deeply loved, so many things happen. It's freeing. Love causes people to be radically generous. When you have been loved deeply, it opens your heart to different kinds of empathy and sympathy. When you have been deeply loved, it reminds you that nobody's too far gone. When you have been deeply loved, it makes you want other people to experience that same kind of deep love, to tell your neighbor about the kind of love that you've received from Jesus. There's no such thing as a purposeless Christian. God saved you and he set you apart for his plan and he is with you always. And he's with us because of his grace. So you see in verse seven and eight, Paul describes the affection that he has for the people in Philippi. And then look at the very end of verse chapter eight. Paul says this, can we get up on the screen? There it is, look at it. For God is my witness, how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He says, he says this, this is just so cool, I love this. He says, the way that I love you, the way that I care for you guys in Philippi, is but a sliver of the way that Jesus loves every single one of us. The affection that Jesus has for me, the affection that Jesus has for you, I can't comprehend it. It's remarkable. You are loved. Jesus thinks about you. Jesus feels your emotions. He's with you in your happiness and in your hurts. And he's also with you wherever you go because of his grace. Jesus loves you. So I wanna pray for us, folks. Can you please bow your heads? I wanna pray for us as a church. I wanna pray for us as a koinonia of believers. And I wanna pray that we would be a church that truly experiences joy. So let's pray. Father, there's so much to be thankful for in this text. There's so much to rejoice about. And Father, I pray that something said this morning, Lord, touched and tugged the heartstrings of somebody here. Father, I pray that if anybody in this room is dealing with some sort of mental fatigue or frustration, Father, I pray that you would remind them that you are thinking about them, you're with them emotionally, and that you will never leave them. Father, I thank you for your grace and I thank you for the cross. Thank you that you saved us. Thank you that you redeemed us. 
And Father, I also just pray that here at River Valley Rogue River, Lord, we would be marked by our joy. And that joy is not based off of what happens in the White House, not based on what happens in fires or anything like that. It's based off of the reality that you are our savior and that you've saved us. So Father, I pray that we would live like we're loved and we would walk boldly and bravely, Lord, in everything that you've given us. I pray for our church, God. Give us strength to continue to persevere. Give us strength to continue to reach people with this story that there's a person named Jesus who loves you more than you could ever imagine. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.